This building holds in trust the records of a nation. It is the United States National Archives in Washington, D.C. Here are preserved the documents most cherished by Americans, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, and many other records that explain the institutions and history of the United States. Through this entrance, with its broad steps, towering columns, and massive bronze doors, pass thousands of persons each year. Students, businessmen, historians, and just plain citizens. It is a favorite stopping place for visitors to the nation's capital. As they enter the stately exhibition hall, they see before them the bronze and marble shrine, which was especially built to display the three great charters that spell out the liberties enjoyed by all Americans. These historic documents are the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Also in the exhibition hall are the massed flags of the 48 states of the Union. Here, for instance, is the flag of California. And this is the standard for Oklahoma. On either side of the shrine, in specially designed cases, are displayed documents concerning many of the important events that led to American independence, to the confederation of the American states, and finally to the establishment of the Federal Union. These are some of the best known papers of American history. Among them are the resolution moving for independence introduced in the Continental Congress in June 1776 by Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, the Articles of Confederation, the nation's first constitution, the Treaty of Paris by which Great Britain in 1783 recognized the independence of her former colonies. On the walls at either side of the shrine are two colorful murals. One shows Thomas Jefferson submitting the Declaration of Independence to John Hancock in the Continental Congress. The other shows James Madison of Virginia delivering the completed Constitution to George Washington, President of the Constitutional Convention. These murals with their faithful portraits of the Founding Fathers are the work of the artist Barry Faulkner. The three great charters are carefully preserved for future generations. To protect them from harmful dust and chemicals in the air, each parchment sheet has been separately sealed within a glass and bronze case containing only the inert gas, helium, and a proper amount of moisture. To shield them from damaging light rays, special yellow filters have been installed in the glass covers of the shrine and over the spotlights that illuminate it. Twenty feet beneath the shrine, a specially constructed vault provides safe storage for the documents when they are not on display or in case of fire. At a moment's notice, an electrically operated mechanism will safely lower the encased documents into this massive vault. Provision has been made for operating the mechanism should electric power fail. Thus, the National Archives has taken every possible precaution for the safe keeping of these historic documents. Here, the documents are being lowered by scissor jacks into the vault. After they are securely in place, the interlocking leaves of the vault's heavy lid close. In a gallery behind the exhibition hall is installed the States of the Union exhibit. For each state are shown documents, maps, or pictures relating to its history. This exhibit is especially popular, for each visitor is eager to study materials on his own state, or perhaps on states where his forefathers lived.
For New York, we see the deed of gift of the Statue of Liberty from the French people to the American people. For Maryland, views of Fort McHenry, the fort that protected Baltimore in the War of 1812 and a report of its defense in 1814. Just after this, Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem. For Florida, one of the many maps made when Spain held the land shows early boundary lines. Then there's the Treaty of 1819, by which Spain ceded the East and West Floridas to the United States for the sum of $5 million. For Utah, are shown these sketches of Western scenes, made by an artist who served with the Army Engineers during the survey of the Great Basin in 1859. These, then, are some of the showpieces of the National Archives. Visitors naturally find them of special interest. But showpieces, after all, are only a small fraction of the building's contents. In its 196 windowless, air-conditioned steel and concrete stack areas, such as this one, are housed nearly 800,000 cubic feet of valuable federal records enough to fill a half million file drawers. In these areas are kept the thousand and one kinds of reports, correspondence, journals, maps, claim papers, legislative papers, and the like that have been chosen for preservation from the great mass of records created in the course of government business since the birth of the Republic. These records of the nation's life are needed to protect the interests of the government and the rights and privileges of its citizens. Before records are placed in the stack areas, they are fumigated in tanks, such as this one, to kill insects and moles which may have attacked them where they had previously been stored sometimes for many years. After a thorough fumigation, they are taken out of the tank and wheeled to the far end of the room, where they are cleaned. Many records come in covered with dirt and dust, which has to be removed by airbrushing, that is, by carefully blowing compressed air over them. Some records come to the National Archives in poor physical condition. Those that have been folded are flattened by use of ordinary electric irons. If an important record shows signs of serious wear, it is put between sheets of cellulose acetate and laminated to seal it permanently against further damage. One of the main tasks of the National Archives is to serve the government and the people of the United States by making available to them either information in the records or the records themselves. Thousands of requests for such services come to the National Archives each year. In fact, almost one per minute during each working day. Trained archivists take these requests and search the records under their care to find the required information. They may have to hunt through ships' passenger lists or veterans' records or records of precedent-setting legal cases. They note down the information needed and then pass it on to the inquirer by letter, telephone, or personal conference. Sometimes they suggest that the inquirers come to the National Archives and examine the records themselves. Many searchers, both government employees and private individuals, come in person to the National Archives to study the records. Some use the large central search rooms with their shelves of lists and guides, a good working library, and several available typewriters and microfilm readers. Here, for instance, is a scholar interested in American diplomatic relations with China during the Boxer Rebellion of 1899 and 1900. He has telephoned ahead to ask for the records he needs and has explained his problem to the archivist in charge. The archivist has consulted the registers and he has in readiness the bound volumes of the State Department's correspondence with American diplomats and consuls in China during that period.
The searcher is much interested in this Chinese sketch. Depicting events of the Boxer Rebellion, it is one of several that were forwarded to the State Department by the American Council in Canton. State Department records indeed are among those most frequently used by scholars, both American and foreign. In addition to the many bound volumes of dispatches from American ambassadors and councils abroad, these records contain treaties such as these with their handsome bindings, ribbons, and seals. Treaties always have been carefully preserved for they form the framework of international law and spell out the obligations of the United States and other nations. Among interesting old documents is this agreement made in Louisiana between the French and the chief of the Cherokee Indian Nation in 1761. Executive orders and proclamations include such historic papers as President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and President Truman's Proclamation of the End of World War II in the Pacific. Equally popular with researchers is the great body of records of the old War and Navy Department. These include the handsomely bound collection of Revolutionary War papers. Sketches showing United States military uniforms which were worn by officers and men in days gone by. A World War I poster in which the Navy appealed to citizens to donate binoculars. Interesting sketches in the journals of Commodore Perry's expedition to Japan in the 1850s. Maps and plans of United States military posts, such as this one of an old fort on Governor's Island in the New York Harbor. This scholar is hunting for pictures for his book on early American inventions. He selects some old patent drawings of a simple hemp spinning machine and of early equipment for undersea divers to illustrate his work. This lawyer is trying to prove a land title for his client. He may want to study papers relating to Spanish land claims in California, treaties with Indian tribes or land entry papers of men who homesteaded in the West. Here in a wing of the search room is a woman who wants to trace her family history. In a veteran's pension application, she finds her grandfather's marriage certificate and an ornate affidavit that he had served honorably in the Civil War. Records in the National Archives are much used to protect the rights of individuals. Take the actual case of a young man who could not prove his citizenship. In fact, he could not even prove he had been born. His parents had told him that he was born aboard the Susquehanna, an American ship that was bringing the family to the United States. But their word was not legal proof. His congressman, however, referred the young man to the National Archives to see if the ship's captain had recorded the event. An archivist gave him the log of the Susquehanna, and in it indeed was the entry telling of his birth. A certified copy of the entry provided by the National Archives was all the man needed to prove his citizenship. Military intelligence officers have used the valuable maps kept in special equipment in this part of the Archives building. Maps originally made for civil purposes are sometimes helpful to the military. During World War II, for example, maps of the Aleutian Islands and maps showing roads and trails in the Philippines proved valuable. Among the millions of photographs in the National Archives are many of historic importance, and large photographs of World War II catch the eyes of servicemen. Especially noteworthy is the collection of Matthew Brady's famous Civil War photographs. Sound recordings also are kept by the National Archives, in its library are the recorded voices of such well-known Americans as Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin D. Roosevelt. The principles for which we stand are the principles of fair play and a square deal for every man and every woman in the United States.
So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. In this theater, historic films are shown on request to those who need to study them. These scenes are from the inaugurations of Presidents McKinley and Wilson. This modern photoscience laboratory makes reproductions of archival materials either as microfilms or photostats. Here we see the making of a microfilm, a very small reproduction. Here is the photostatal machine in operation making a reproduction the exact size of the original. Records in great demand for research are printed or microfilmed. All of the volumes on this table are reproduced on microfilm rolls in six small boxes. And to those who want reproductions of the great documents of United States history, faithful facsimiles are sold at moderate prices. The Emancipation Proclamation, Washington's first inaugural address, and his Yorktown map are a few of the National Archives facsimiles. Charters of Freedom, a handsome booklet containing readable reproductions of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, is an especially popular souvenir of a visit to the National Archives. The National Archives is a custodian of the living past and a link with the unborn future. There is significance in the phrases, study the past and what is past is prologue. These are carved beneath the statues flanking one entrance to this beautiful building in which are preserved the drama and romance of America's history. <laughs> 